Uh, what is the goal of this panel discussion? It's not to ask questions on uh, specific technical details, for instance, on Pasquale's work or on uh, Duan's work or, or on Alessandra's work. The objective is to ask questions that relate to the broader area of uh, neural symbolic AI. And in particular, we don't want easy questions and we don't want uh, questions of the form of symbolic uh, reasoning is great and it's fully explainable, neural networks are not explainable. No, the, the, the important thing here and that unfortunately I haven't seen this a lot, is to bring to the surface all the limitations and all the bad things that need to be resolved. Having said that, I see that Kobe um, said that first we should introduce ourselves and potentially I have to do this because I didn't introduce myself at the very beginning. So my name is Effie. I'm working in uh, Samsung AI in Cambridge. My background is uh, symbolic learning. And uh, I have recently started working on neural symbolic integration, and uh, I have some amazing collaborators on that front. Uh, the other panelists, if they can introduce themselves. Zahun, let's start from you because you are new here. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, this is Jeff. Nice to see you. Uh, I work with Epic. So I, I, I'm basically in Samsung Research in South Korea. So it's 11 p.m. So a little, a little bit of time for me. <laughs> so. Uh, Basically, uh, I work for uh, knowledge graph construction and its applications. The applications include uh, some uh, QA technology in voice assistant in Samsung. Uh, we call it as a big C and some sort of recommendation technology by leveraging deep learning and knowledge graph based reasoning. So nice to see you. Thank you, Zahun. Vaisak, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Effie. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Waishak. I'm faculty at the University of Edinburgh and part of the Alan Turing Institute. My research has been in uh, artificial intelligence uh, since as long as I can remember. Uh, but recently, uh, uh, my focus has also been on trying to uh, integrate uh, uh, logic and learning mainly, but also looking at logic and probability theory and trying to look at integrations of that. Thank you, Effie. Thank you, Waishak. Uh, Alessandra, Antoine, Pasquale, if you can say. Okay, so I go next. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Alessandra Russo. I'm a professor in computing department in Pedia College. And my uh, research focus and interest has been uh, always on symbolic machine learning or logic-based learning uh, with an amazing advancement there. And more recently, uh, we're looking at this combination of uh, uh, machine learning, which could be deep learning, enforcement learning with the symbolic learning. So we are still quite uh you know supporter of uh, uh combined rather than uh, completely fully integrated uh, you know other differentiable or other symbolic so maintain the you know modular approach to it thank you alessandra uh, antoine if you could say again a couple of things and then Pasquale. yeah uh hi everybody i am antoine i'm a assistant professor at epfl um, and I generally work on neurosymbolic integration, particularly for understanding language, uh, which, you know, kind of brings its, its own little interesting tidbits uh, to the problem when you can't necessarily rely on what you're reading being actually true <laughs> to begin with. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, from my perspective, I, 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 I enjoy integrating symbolic aspects into neural architectures, but I probably do come at the problem a bit more from a neural background. Uh, where I actually try to use these structures to, to ground the types of architectures we can uh, construct, uh, but primarily focusing on, you know, what we can learn from large scale data uh, in the first place, and then using symbolic methods to, um, you know, tie those representations down to, uh, to, to particular constructs that are unlikely to be learned solely from data in the first place. Very good. Um, Alexander Pasquale. Oh. Okay, I think I'm next. So yeah, hi, I'm Pasquale. I'm a, a senior research fellow at UCL. And um, I mainly work on NLP, uh, like question answering and, and um, um, reading comprehension, but whatnot, and, and on learning on from graph structured data. And um, more recently, um, one in the last few months, I've been working quite a bit on, uh, um, so I, I fell a bit in love with methods that allow you to backpropagate through symbolic algorithms. And we have something at, 
uh, near episode, um, in a few weeks about that. Um, and basically my interest uh, like uh, on anything that could help us in a sense overcome the limitations of modern uh, machine learning systems in terms, for example, in explainability, out of distribution generalization and uh, the deficiency. Good. Uh, Alexander uh, Gray will uh, join us soon, so we can start. The first question is the following. What do you see as the major constraints area that prevent an efficient and effective uh, neurosymbolic integration? Alessandra, shall we start from you? For me? Okay. So... All right, so I, I mean, it's, uh, if uh, we can maintain the two different components, as I was talking before in my presentation, so which is the differentiable or the machine learning and the symbolic without necessarily inputting or integrating one into the other. So um, I think, uh, um, as I was also pointing out in my talk this morning, one of the biggest challenge is uh, that we find in practice is uh, scalability of the symbolic aspect. So, so the, the, I think the two big problems is the scalability from the symbolic, from the pure symbolic point of view, and uh, and and the data efficiency and the, you know so uh, you know uncertainty in the predictions of the neuro symbolic, the neuro part, if you like when applied on large data in the case of uh, outside distributions, uh, and, uh, you know, and, or maybe when we have a few amount of data. So I think these are technical challenges, which they can be addressed if, you know, people are working at that. So I think uh, if they were going to overcome, I think this can provide a big step forward uh, to, the, um, to this combination of compositionality of AI uh, tools and uh, technology, right? So, and I think it is, but we still need to maintain, in my view, one of the big challenge is maintaining the interpretability and the explainability of what has been learned. I think that's why I believe from my angle, maintaining the two different approaches, the symbolic and the differentiable would help, all right? So uh, instead of integrating everything into differentiable uh, you know, directions, if you like. Maybe I give space to others so to say. Sure, sure. Discuss. Um, Antoine, do you want to say your view? Thank you very much, Alessandro. You have to unmute. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think in general, there's, you know, from 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 an ideas perspective, there's not, uh, you know, too many constraints on on what we can do. I think the biggest challenge in, in neurosymbolic these days is just, you know, coming at this from the perspective of natural language processing. Though I imagine it's similar in other areas such as computer vision, um, that we're we're kind of fighting against this torrent that is just, you know, so powerful in the way it can optimize to the benchmarks we have available to measure progress. Um, and so when it you know, comes time to actually show the benefits of some of these neurosymbolic methods that we can come up with, um, we don't necessarily have the right way to measure these capabilities against something like a large scale language model that we can just throw a thousand uh, you know, new layers at with a million or billion new parameters uh, and have it you know, just completely overwhelm the performance on the benchmark such that it becomes harder to convince people uh, that you know these these methods are are worthwhile, and so we can fall back on things, you know, such as interpretability or, or explainability, um, you know. But but even then, you're you're already fighting a losing battle if you can't actually you know match the performance of the other systems. Um, you know, so an alternative here is to use kind of you know more slightly constrained tasks that are dedicated towards actually showcasing the particular abilities of, uh, of neurosymbolic methods. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a particular fan of the the clutter data sets. Uh, that Pasquale mentioned, I think it's 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 a lot of fun. But then you know you you obviously kind of you know you're 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 subject to the criticism that you're working on toy problems rather than actually attacking the real uh, you know problem of language, which is noisy and has a lot of intricacies and diversity that can't really be matched. Um, and so I guess you know after you know hitting on benchmarking for the last two minutes, maybe the the real problem that we should focus on is scalability being able to create this methods at roughly, you know, the same scale uh, that current large scale language models or current vision models or language and vision models uh, are actually trying, are actually getting to uh, with their own approaches. How can we push neurosymbolic methods uh, in that same direction, um, knowing full well that, you know, we don't get a million shots at designing the interfaces between both types of AI uh, as we actually try to produce these types of systems. 
Isaac, you are a key uncertainty person. What is your view on that? Yeah, I was just going to say that I have a fairly different take on it. Um, I mean, the way I think of this is that, you know, as far as uh, logic goes back, the things we have cared about in logic are things like syntax, semantics, uh, and then we have a specific kind of reasoning problem attached to it, either it's deduction or abduction or whatever. And we have never said that there should, needs to be a restriction on the proof length, of the, you know, the language can be arbitrary, arbitrarily complex and we can measure the complexity of this expressiveness. Uh, when I look at some of the work in neurosymbolic systems, I often feel that people don't quite uh, care about this kind of uh, issues. And I think what comes out of it is a sense of ad hocness in terms of the way these proposals come out. There isn't quite a clear distinction made about what the language they ch choose to want to model and why this is important or what kind of features, you know, from a reasoning point, uh, this allows. And I think this means that the theory of neurosymbolic systems in some sense is lacking. So, and that's one of the reasons where I do see very interesting papers fo focusing on applications but not quite as much focusing on semantics. We saw a few talks today, uh, for instance, where this was an exception, and that's great to see. Uh, but this is, I think, an issue for the larger problem. The other kind of thing that I also worry about is that as far as this distinction between, you know, the whole neurosymbolic was about integrating symbolic versus sub-symbolic sub components, but not quite a clear distinction is made about which parts need to be symbolic and which parts need to be sub-symbolic. It's all, again, a very ad hoc process process or this application demands that that part needs to be sub-symbolic uh, but you know kind of a clear conceptual theory about what we need is is fairly lacking and this would make the area not very really attractive to mathematicians you know and other people interested in formal theory yeah very good points by Isaac the next question is for our industry uh, sector in this panel and it targets first Zahun Zahun do you think that uh, neural symbolic frameworks are mature enough to be in commercial products or they are just some academic formulations in order to publish papers? Yes, oh, okay, that's a really good question. So I believe uh, uh, it's relatively you know, um, beginning stage, uh, right? And yeah. So, yes, uh, for commercialization, uh, I believe uh, two aspects, uh, we need to see two aspects. First one is to find a very good use case, good scenario, uh, uh, which is very attractive for users. You know that, uh, okay, we know that uh, neural symbolic learning is very good in terms of technological perspective, but uh, what value uh, could go to users? That's, that's the first problem. And the second problem is, uh, it's more like efficiency. So uh, from my perspective, uh, it's best if the model can run on device. So if, yes, neural symbolic uh, model uh, could be running on device level, then that would be really good. So I believe that two aspects uh, is really important to me. Thank you, Zahun. Uh, very interesting insights. Anyone else wants to uh, comment on the maturity of existing neural symbolic approaches? I will go to the next question, which is not easy either. The next question is, uh, <laughs> we are discussing a lot about explainability. And um, we, the symbolic, most of us we would say in this panel who are coming from the symbolic uh, based reasoning community, mm. argue that um, um, we are fully explainable. So we are beating the machine learning community with black boxes. However, there are, I think, two key issues that we need to consider. The first is, I don't think that when we are talking about explainable systems, we target the symbolic part. We mostly target the sub-symbolic part. So the key question is, can logic somehow help us understand the interiors of a machine learning black box? This is the first question. And the second question is, what are the characteristics of this explanation methods that can be boosted potentially by symbolic-based reasoning? 
Shall we start from uh, Pasquale? Pasquale, your turn. I'm happy to, to give time to someone else. I'm going to need to repeat that too. Uh, shall we? Yeah, if, maybe, maybe you could just ask a clarification. Are you, your question is uh, whether uh, the symbolic learning could help improve the explainability of the deep, of the sub-symbolic models, uh, or whether how we will be doing explainability also in the symbolic uh, uh, layer. So which of these, maybe if you can a little bit, yeah. In the symbolic layer, I think the notion of explainability is obvious to everyone. We have rules, we can do abduction, we can do whatever we want. Mm. We can produce proof trees. Mm. The key question is, I don't think that people from the Massilian community are um, crazy about explainability in the symbolic based community. They want to learn what is happening inside the neural network. And to that front, how potentially techniques for explainability can benefit from logic? Can we use logic to interpret neural networks? Can we use logic in order to uh, explain some parts of neural networks or to potentially come up with alternative representations that could, could help a naive user understand what is happening inside the black box? Okay, so maybe I would just add to that. It will just start by maybe the discussion or by pointing out a few things. I think that, yeah, that oh, there is work on explainable AI from a differentiable point of view, right? So the interesting survey by Mueller, I think there was there's a very nice paper on that, uh, where there is a classification of what explainable AI means, right? In a differential, in a sub symbolic domain. And, uh, and there are different angles to look at. And so explainable, explainability tends to be more related to variability of output uh, if there's a variability of input. It's more the relationship between input output of the black box, right? So try to understand what the black box is doing in terms of, okay, if we alter certain things in the input, what would be the impact on the output, right? So, and that work also, I don't remember the name of the author, sorry, I'm really bad with names. <laughs> this is one of my big problems, I never remember people's name. But there's been work on uh, using uh, abductive method, abductive reasoning yes. for linking explainability between input and output, right? So uh, people are, yeah. are doing the kind of symbolic... Uh, Antonio's cacas. Yeah, well, yes, I mean, but the application to different, different okay, so, so, so. the application to differentiable domain, to the explainability of differentiable model, uh, you know, so neural network model, for instance, leveraging this kind of abductive framework uh, uh, in a particular way. So uh, people are looking at that, and the people are also looking at developing methods for explaining the internal relationship between, I don't know, activation layer, activation nodes, in the neural network. Of course, uh, I'm less familiar with that. Maybe other people in the panel will know more about that. Uh, but there is the scope of, uh, of um, you know, uh, exploration. The question is, how do we understand what numbers really mean? <laughs> how do we understand what, the, you know, in a more abstract sense? So I think if we had a way of uh, better disentangle the representation in the inner layer of the architecture, we might be able maybe to constrain those inner layer a little bit. My pity Alexander is not in the panel here. So a little bit more in order to be able to extract some form of explainability during the, um, the inference process of the network, you know, across layers, across nodes. So that maybe is uh, my thinking, but I think we are far from it at the moment, my view. Vaisak, what is your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think Alessandra may, may put it beautifully. Uh, I mean, I think on the one hand, right, in the 90s, we had some great work uh, in, in, in the logic field on explanations and diagnosis and whatnot. And then on the other hand, uh, what we also have uh, we also have recently, in fact, uh, our approaches that uh, that are trying to do SAT encodings of things like random forests and trying to see if you can provide a logical means for explanations. But I think one thing that's underlying all of these different ideas is if you think about what constitutes as an explanation, it is meant to be minimal, succinct, and somehow relevant uh, to, to the question you ask. So in some sense, it is a more constructive thing rather than the way logicians typically say logic is explainable, right? What they mean is read through the rules. I'm sure you'll understand what's going on. But in fact, explanations are meant to somehow extract 
uh, some kind of information that is not easy to obtain just by looking at the structure. And on that regard, I think there still needs to be even ideas on the symbolic side to really make progress, right? So there's been work on causality, uh, trying to understand, again, you could see causality as a kind of symbolic approach because you're constructing, you're symbolically manipulating some kind of mathematical object to define what is an explanation. Um, so I, I, you know, I, with Alessandra, I agree that we are far from it. And what we would ideally need is on the one hand, as Alessandra put it, a way to extract from from one of these differential models, a kind of symbolic structure that can be interpreted by us logicians, but then you also need some kind of causality or logic-based theory of explanations that can provide some notion of minimality and succinctness uh, to this extracted object, which can then be offered as an explanation, right? And I don't think that we have really made a progress on that front. We are happy to say, I've extracted this program from the neural network, look, it's interpretable. Uh, now go away and let me move on to the next paper, right? Which is not not really taking the step towards uh, the broader vision, I think. I see. Um, Alan, uh, you have a comment, please unmute yourself, turn on the camera and please join the panel discussion. And anyone else from the audience who wants to join the panel discussion, ask questions or make a comment, please do so. Okay, th thanks very much, Effie. So um, in, in the work that Kobe was talking about in his lightning talk this morning, we've taken a certain attitude to many of the questions that you raised. So on, on the scalability issue, for instance, rather than try to form some huge common sense knowledge base, we're treating the internet as our store of knowledge. And there are many, you know, there's a huge amount of di diverse knowledge out there, which we, we just couldn't cope with. I mean, if, you know, if we tried to curate all that into some knowledge base, um, you know, we might get somewhere one year and the next year there's twice as much, you know, so I mean, it's growing exponentially. So you just can't keep up. So our idea is to <clears throat> select what we need to answer the question at hand and curate it locally and dynamically. Um, so actually, we might end up with quite a small knowledge base, which is tuned to the problem at hand. And then uh, on the explanation side, which is which is what I put in my in my question on the Slack, um, <clears throat> we're trying to explain the sort of meta level reasoning that goes on in answering the questions. Why did we go to this particular selection of knowledge bases to get our questions? Why did we think those were the best places to go? What information did we get from them? Um, and then which reasoning methods did we apply? So, you know, part of what we're doing is using a diverse collection of reasoning methods, some deductive, some statistical. Um, so, you know, making predictions using regression, for instance. Um, so, you know, which methods did we combine to solve this problem? And why did we choose that particular combination? And I think that's that's a very important part of explanation. Um, in some sense, maybe is more satisfying to the customer to know, you know, not exactly which steps we took, but why we took that general approach um, and, and what would be the limitations of it and so on. Um, and, and, and I think, the symbolic reasoning is particularly good at that kind of explanation. I think I struggle to see how one would do that from a machine learning point of view, but maybe that's because I'm a dyed in the wool logician. Um, but I think that's that's where the symbolic uh, reasoning will come in in this kind of meta level. What what uh, what Kobe called algorithmic reasoning. It's sort of dealing with the system engineering aspects of what of what you've done. Oh, okay, I've said enough. I'll stop there. Uh, again, please, if anyone from the audience has a question or wants to make a comment or in general wants to say something, please do. So uh, I, I, sorry, I, I, I would please. answer Alan to say that there are, there are some initiatives at trying to do what you just described um, in, the, in the machine learning and, you know, generally uh, neural models community. Uh, so, you know, one thing that's, that's gotten some traction over, over the last year is things like data sheets where you know data sets themselves that are used to train certain models have descriptions of you know where that content was pulled from how was it curated you know what type of pre-processing was done on the data uh, before a model uh, was trained on it um, similarly once you have a trained model you know we started uh, working with these notion of model cards you know descriptions for a model of you know once again what data was it trained on what is its architecture you know, different uh, details of, about the post-processing that's done to its type to its predictions, uh, such that it can be, um, I guess, a, a description 
of what went into building that model, both from a data perspective and an architecture perspective. But it's that's, still a very coarse view. On, that sounds on like symbolic reasoning to me, Antoine. That doesn't sound like machine learning. It sounds like an explanation of the of the meta view of the of the machine learning. I mean, if, if, if I mean, ultimately, <laughs> the predictions being made by the model are still, uh, you know, completely statistically derived by what the yeah, corpus sure. represents. Yeah. But yeah, the, the the descriptions themselves are are symbolic, um, yeah. and you know. But I, I I think that generally, when we're working with explainability, this is this is a good start. Yes. Um, in that, at the very least, for 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 practitioners who may have no idea what these systems have been trained on, what they've learned from, it, it's a good place for them to to be able to to actually get a bit of knowledge about you know what it is they're about to deploy, uh, which is you know much bigger problem than uh, many of us might expect, uh, but it's not necessarily giving us kind of the fine grained example level explainability uh, that, you know, many applications actually require in order to, to have these predictions be, be audited. Uh, you know, I think Pasquale was, was giving some, some great examples earlier on complex query answering for, for drug discovery um, or, you know, medical procedures. Uh, you know, that's the type of setting where you really want each prediction you make to be auditable. Uh, for why that prediction is being made. And, and, and neural models, unfortunately, really don't, you know, give you that insight uh, that you might want. And, you know, I, I would take it a step further and say that unless you specifically design your neural architecture in mind with the idea that it needs to produce interpretable representations, and maybe even go even further and say that that representation has to have a symb symbolic bottleneck at some point, you're never going to be able to confirm that that explanation is faithful to the prediction that you're actually making, or sorry, vice versa, that the prediction is faithful to the explanation. So right now, this, sorry for chiming in, uh, like just to mention, basically right now there's some research on models that can jointly produce uh, layback predictions and also natural language explanations. But yeah, uh, as you mentioned, unless you kind of explicitly constrain the representations, like you don't really have guarantees um, that the explanation is correlated in any way with, um, with um, the, the prediction. And also another problem that um, Oana Kamburu found out, found out uh, in ACL, I think last year or two years ago, basically she found out that it's very easy to trick those models to produce explanations that contradict themselves, basically. So the same model can tell you, yeah, the, here the label is one because, for example, the seagull is a bird. And then for the next example, the, the model can also tell you, yeah, the, here the label is it's also one because the, a seagull is not a bird. So uh, yeah, basically our conclusion was that if you let the model uh, also produce natural language explanations without any other constraint on the representations, that can even be worse because it can even decrease the trust of the user in the model even more than just producing the, the label alone, basically. But can I respond to Antoine? Because yeah. it seems to me that sometimes you do need that low level step-by-step -step explanation to be convincing, but often it's, it's enough or it's at least an important part of it to know that you've consulted reputable sources. You know, to know that you've gone to the best experts, you've looked in the right books and so on. So, you know, as as a as a non-expert customer of some expert service, that's the sort of thing I might want to know mm -hmm. more than try to follow some detailed legal or medical argument, for instance. And uh, closing this uh, session about explain this section about explainability. Um, I really want to, to copy something that the uh, team from Google Brain uh, originally said. There is no ring to rule all the other rings. There is no single explanation technique that fits all our purposes. Mm -hmm. So we should redefine, adjust, modify, alter, revamp, whatever the notion of explainability based on the task and on the end user. And this is something very crucial, I think, in order to uh, develop uh, applications that uh, people and users can trust. Yeah. The next question, how important is to incorporate model and deal with uncertainty when integrating the symbolic with sub-symbolic words. Please, yeah, please, Alessandra, go ahead, go ahead. 
That's going to give you a very you know, personal experience. And when we try to do this integration in a way that I hadn't, I didn't have time today in the talk to go through all the various graphs. But for instance, in try to integrate uh, uh, sort of deep learning models, uh, sub symbolic models, which are trained, right, and then applied on auto distribution data, we realized that, for instance, there are new, uh, recent uh, architecture for dealing with uncertainty, you know, um, in a deep network. And if the network is able actually to not to quantify the uncertainty they have about the data and use yeah. that information in learning uh, in learning a symbolic or abstract level representation, and then the overall performance is actually much better, right? So and is much more robust. So uh, so the EDL there's a, there's, there's a, an architecture that uses subjective logic to get a yeah. network that does that kind of work, and uh, and I we realize in our experience that actually. Uh, uh, are better in the kind of a compositional AI that we wanted to try to develop, right? So it's really key, but it's also key for the symbolic things, right? I have to say, because uh, in, uh, in, you know, any machine learning, whether symbolic or sub-symbolic, is as good as the data you provide, right? So in a sense, uh, the, the, even the knowledge that you learn, it can be very general and symbolic in terms of first of the logic or whatever, but if you haven't seen certain cases, then you're not going to cover those cases, right? So it's still within uh, the scope of the data set that uh, or, or the features that you have the system has observed. So for instance, in the, from a symbolic point of view, we actually ask the question, uh, okay, how, how can we quantify that symbolically? You know, how many new extra data or slightly different data than what we already uh, observed needed to provide the system? So, so symbolically, we can change our knowledge, you know, the knowledge that we acquire, you know, we can actually shift the prediction and the model that we learn. So that's actually another aspect of talking about uncertainty certainty, if you like, from a symbolic point of view. And then as a third point is really maybe bringing a vice into the discussion yeah. is really the combination of probability, probabilistic influence with the symbolic influence, which is uh, one of the key aspect. You know, uh, Alexander was talking about upper and lower threshold to understand where something is uh, closer to true or close to false, and then the middle is kind of unknown, right? So it's a little bit of a mesh of, of truth uh, values, the real value uh, logic. So um, I think we need to be able to reason with this a different degree of truth, also from a symbolic point of view. So there is a scope for advancement in that direction too. So and all of these, uh, all of these technology are really vital in order to push forward a new symbolic AI. Uh, stream. I mean, it's worth, I guess, uh, also uh, uh, appreciating that this is a deep question, right? I mean, uh, from even recent AAAI conferences, there have been discussions in the third wave of AI, uh, discussions with Daniel Kahneman and whatnot. And again, we don't quite have a very good theory for uh, potentially coming up with any kind of artificial framework that mimics the so-called system one versus system two reasoning. And many are under the impression that perhaps logic and machine learning side by side can play this role, but we don't really know how. Uh, so in that sense, you know, the research that's happening in neurosymbolic AI is extremely interesting because maybe it does provide one proxy uh, to this kind of approach or this kind of framework uh, without, you know, without uh, really uh, seeing that this is how humans do it, right? So we're not really committing and saying humans necessarily, you know, manipulate symbols in their head, but we are saying, you know, thought processes in humans seem to be uh, able to abstract to, to a symbolic structure, uh, uh, but, but they are humans are also dealing with observations. So we need a kind of framework where these two things sit together. So I think it's a very deep question. We're kind of trying to get at the heart of uh, heart of the matter here. Pasquale, any comment on this? I'll answer it with you. Uh, yeah, I don't have strong feelings, um, um, like, uh, like kind of in favor or against uncertainty. Like uh, one problem with the kind of integ integrating uh, symbolic and sub-symbolic methods, in my experience is maybe that, um, how to say, when you, uh, so we, I, I think we're kind of overly obsessing with, um, uh, stochastic gradient descent, because one problem you have with the symbolic systems is that it's very hard to get any, let's say, gradient gradients out of them. Because, for example, if you um, let's consider the extra, um, if you ch change the weights um, of kind of instead of a graph a bit. Um, and then you feed kind of those like this graph, this weighted graph to the extra to find the shortest path from A to B. 
um, the shortest path is always the same, right? So the output doesn't change. So this means that um, um, in, I think in many cases, uh, symbol symbolic uh, components tend to behave like piecewise constant functions. So it's um, um, it, it's kind of it's very hard with uh, like to to backpropagate to them in a sense, uh, and maybe uncertainty and maybe instead of having a single fixed solution out of the um, out of the model, like having a distribution of uh, solutions. Um, um, can be a way uh, to kind of relax that and uh, to work around that. Uh, but in case we stick with uh, backpropagation and uh, stochastic gradient descent, another approach that I think would be interesting for the, kind of, for the sake of symbolic sub-symbolic integration is to completely maybe move away from gradient descent and start considering other uh, optimization techniques, which are kind of a bit kind of maybe dismissed at the moment, but maybe it can, is it clear what I mean? Uh, uh, like maybe if we want to kind of still keep to obsessing with the gradient descent, maybe uncertainty kind of this could be a key component to be able to back propagate through dissonance in a sense. So, so sorry if I understood uh, your your um, um, comment, Pasquale. Is that you think that uncertainty can potentially be used in order to guide the neural learning process? Yeah, basically, um, uh, to one limitation of um, uh, one problem with um, integrating symbolic sub symbolic components is that the symbolic components don't really provide gradients uh, uh, because they yes. have, the output doesn't change if we do infinitesimalism or perturbations to the input in many cases. But yes, but, but, from... you can have, but you can have the you can have the abductive proofs. So essentially, then you can operate on the level of abductive proofs in order to. Again, you made a comment about uh, symbolic components that you, they don't provide you gradients. That's true. Mm -hmm. But what they provide you as are the, the abductive proofs, what you should give in the input in order to get a desired output. And out of these proofs, there are recently proposed some techniques which allow you to compute some gradients. And this is what we also did in our AAAI paper with Loisus on compositional systems. We used the abductive proofs and we computed gradients in order to yep. backpropagate. Yeah, but it seems something very kind of ad hoc uh, because maybe you have, um, let's say, an, um, a, uh, so maybe you have a model that computes, for example, that predicts the cost of energy in, um, in a grid. Then you have a black box component, kind of a symbolic like an algorithm that, given the cost of energy, allocates kind of the production of items optimally uh, in the grid. And if you change the cost of energy by an infinitesimally small amount, the output of this component that get all optimally allocates the uh, production of items doesn't change. So basically, the, the gradient is zero in a sense. Alessandra in, wants to make a comment. On this, on this yeah, I think I wanted to follow up on this discussion and actually what you're pointing out. I think that the, 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 the point, uh, maybe Basquale, if I understand correctly, so your point is uh, if we want to do some uh, back propagation through the logic, right? So then I take your point. But if we are maintaining the symbolic representation of component and the neuro sub symbolic component as uh, not necessarily fully integrated and end to end. So we can explain the symbolic, the symbolic component can explain all the unknown possible situation that could arise, right? And yeah. then use that uh, uh, guide to the, you know, through yeah. an intermediate layer to the neural network to say, okay, look at these particular cases. So, so these are the cases that symbolically we know we have less knowledge about, we are more uncertain about. So therefore, can we then give that information to the neural network just in terms of, uh, particular signal uh, you know, in particular type of uh, uh, classification output, if you like, or the neural network that will help train the network a little bit better in certain cases, and maybe pulling them out of some form of local minima, some kind where they get trapped, right? So I think that is the discussion, if, if I understand correctly what- you Yeah, I, I agree with you. It is a matter, of, this is what I was trying to say before, but yeah. I, I think you described, you described it better than me. No, it's okay. I think this is interesting because that's where, going back to the a topic we were discussing before, what I think uh, Vaishak pointed out, what kind of level we want the symbolic, what kind of level we want the yeah. symbolic, right? So, and I think the symbolic layer has got this strong power reasoning about possibilities, right? Either for abduction or for or the uncertain or the incompleteness of the knowledge. And that at a much higher level of abstraction, and that can be 
used uh, in a much lower level of sub-symbolic uh, you know, uh, training, if you like, right? And I think uh, that's one of the reasons why I very much advocate maintaining these two things separate in a sense, right? They combine necessarily together because, but from my perspective, because uh, you can exploit a little bit more some of this reasoning power. Thank you very much, Alessandra. The next question is target again our industry sector, the whole. What kind of applications do you think that um, they could be benefited by integrating symbolic with sub-symbolic reasons? For example, medical applications or assistance or um, what kind of, of new yeah. technology would be enabled? You know, uh, I do not have a clear answer for that. I'm thinking as well, but uh, I believe uh, the application should include this very expertise knowledge. So uh, as you mentioned, medical knowledge would be a very good uh, application, I believe. And the second one is, as I mentioned, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, in the field of recommendation area, uh, uh, the cold start problem is really a uh, difficult problem to solve. So I believe, uh, uh, to address a cold start problem in recommendation, uh, it will be working as well. Thank you very much, Zahun. Um, Antoine, because you are um, you have worked on vision applications, do you see a clear benefit of using logic in vision applications, or you see some benefit, but we are far from claiming that there is a victory? Um, I mean, I, I obviously somebody in computer vision. And who specializes in that could could have a better opinion than myself, but you know I think I think it really depends on you know what is the level of vision that you're actually you know trying to accomplish here. You you worked um, on Visual QA, for instance. Um, yeah. So you know, working on Visual QA, you know, I think it's at least in in, in many of the the data sets that we currently use. Um, it's it's pretty clear that neurosymbolic components have prob uh, promise at creating some of these compositional representations to actually build up uh, descriptions of what is seen in the images. You know, the big I think you know rage a few years back were these neural module networks uh, that would kind of you know build up uh, you know logical combinations of, of different items and, and different uh, reasoning operators to be able to to answer questions about scenes. Um, but, you know, I, I think this, this kind of comes back to being able to benchmark these things correctly and in, 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 in a manner that actually captures uh, what is being shown in these images, because at the same time, while these, these, these methods were cool and, you know, did some nice things and had these explainable properties where we could see, you know, what was the reasoning procedure that was being constructed, you know, from what objects in order to answer the question, you know, they still generally did five to 10% worse than purely neural methods. Uh, that didn't actually rely, you know, on this on the structural grounding. Um, so it's it, it always comes back to you know can we find the right use case uh, where you know this is this is a fair fight and yeah. I think that um, you know we 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 kind of you know hinted at that you know in the way the question was framed is that ultimately this depends on domain specialization. I think right now when we operate in open world settings. We, we generally find ourselves in situations where it's very difficult uh, to actually approximate an open world with some type of closed form data set, uh, such that a, a neurosymbolic system is going to beat a purely neural method that is large, deep, and trained on more data than is imaginable uh, <laughs> without necessarily replicating that same type of scale with the neurosymbolic method. Um, meanwhile, if you can actually constrain the domain in such a way that it, uh, it, it, it reflects particular properties that you can actually conceptualize in a symbolic system, so code uh, was a good example, biomedical, I'm a bit less certain about, uh, but it's one of, it, that is the setting, I think, where you're actually going to be able to see the major benefits uh, of these technologies. You said code, if I understood well. Yeah, code. What, what is that? Sorry if I uh, being able to let's say generate source code. Okay, um, so, so, know, despite, so, so, so. despite see, the see, fact so. that these days it seems like some of the most successful methods for that are also so, purely so, neural so. And, and gigantic. Yeah, um, yeah. It seems that you know maybe it's it's just underexplored, yeah. but some combination uh, yeah. of these neural methods with a with a symbolic backend that maybe just evaluates yeah. the code for correctness uh, would already be uh, an improvement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Thank you, Tuan. Uh, Alexander, welcome back to panel discussion. Uh, I would like to ask you the two questions that I originally asked. So first, do you think that um, neurosymbolic approaches are mature enough to be in production to be delivered to the end customer? And second, what kind of applications you think that would benefit a lot from this kind of synergy? Yeah, on the first question, I um, well, let me let me reverse the the order. Um, I, I think I I agree with Antoine. The um, we sort of have some slightly unfair setups right now, in a way uh, you could say a lot of the benchmarks are you know whether intended or not um, effectively assuming a machine learning or pattern recognition solution. And so the training sets are, are there, label training sets and so on. So, you know, like Q, uh, you know, natural language question answering is one that we work on a lot. Yeah, they're sort of <laughs> designed, um, you could say to, you know, somehow or another, even though um, we, you know, we know that we can't really achieve natural language understanding today, but somehow that, you know, everything does like 90% plus on all these benchmarks. So, um, so there's something, you know, kind of, kind of wrong here with our benchmarks. They're not, I think, at least if I think of the, you know, 90% 90, 90 should be, you know, if we, Things are getting 90%, then 100% should be like human intelligence. And it's like, <clears throat> shouldn't, we shouldn't be giving ourselves an A right now. Uh, um, so uh, part of it is, you know, being able to return uh, in that particular setup, it's being able to return, you know, um, pre-canned uh, sentences as answers. We can sort of allow that in the benchmarks. So it's possible to make the benchmarks much harder. Um, so uh, yeah, but it but that's hard. So and this is partly why we've converged a little bit on interactive fiction as at least one way to do that. It's much harder to game that because in that particular setup, you're not measured. Uh, we sort of e evade the entire uh, possibility of being able to sort of fool um, you know, viewers into thinking it's provided an intelligent answer. So you know, things like GPT-3 or whatever, where it generates some text, but, and it, it looks really smart, but um, you, know, the, the, uh, you, you kind of know that it's not really based on true understanding in the same sense as you know, or in the reasoning sense or, or uh, and, and so on, but but you have this inescapable. But it looks so smart. But in um, but in uh, and, and the same with you know just uh, you could argue just a Google search. It can just by retrieving keywords, you can do amazingly well, mm -hmm. returning a, a a sentence somewhere in a document. It really looks like it understands. So you can evade that whole thing though by measuring the number of steps in some kind of game to achieve a goal because there's no there's no implicit like it you know it looks sort of looks like the right answer you actually have to whatever get to the end of the dungeon with, with actions that actually achieve the right things so um so that's one example uh that i like and and things like vqa and so on I think still have this kind of issue like uh, like uh, in, in language QA. So, <clears throat> but it, you know, but it takes more effort to make a setup uh, that's, that's uh, action, it requires actually actual smart actions. So some, you know, a vision version of, of, the, of this interactive fiction would be one possibility, but someone would have to sit down and make a game or something. Um, so, so I, I think the field needs to push toward these more difficult benchmarks. Um, 
you know, even things like Atari games and so on, and just not quite hard enough to push uh, the need for, you know, knowledge and reasoning that we need in a more sophisticated task. Um, now, but once you make things harder like that, I think that then the maturity question you ask comes into play where I think we've more or less, I think one of the, some of the fundamental issues we, we uh, are getting a handle on at the moment, um, maybe um, things like, at least for me, having a good mathematical footing and, and so on, on, on uh, characterizing uh, the reasoning and stuff like that. But scale, you know, scale <laughs> is, uh, you know, what held back arguably neural nets um, for many decades. Uh, GPUs helped, you know, the realization you could map these things to GPUs and so on was a big breakthrough there. Um, so, so that I think is the, you know, big class of things more or less that um, all of the neurosymbolic, uh, you know, methods so far really, you know, kind of demonstrate on small problems because you have a, you have a few things, you know, you have the inter inherent combinatorial nature, of course, of reasoning. Um, and uh, you have to, even though, I mean, one thing working in our favor is that uh, decades have, have passed where computers are much faster, things that used to be much, you know, pretty hard from a reasoning standpoint or not as hard, but, but still it's combinatorial. So, but we have things like, you know, that's why we're excited about things like RL for learning to prove, uh, to guide the improvers. Um, it's possible you can, you know, look at the common things that uh, you want to prove um, and, and uh, you know, the patterns in your particular domain and learn efficient search strategies um, and, and uh, you know, cut down that combinatorialness. So scale, I think, is my short answer for what's what's the biggest thing. Left. I mean, there are a lot of things to work out, but, yeah, but that's yeah, yeah, the yeah. next step, I think. Yeah. I think uh, uh, one thing interesting, I was just going to interject, uh, uh, if, if that's OK, if you one thing that's sure, sure. interesting to note is that, you know, in some sense, this all goes back to the Turing test, right? Because uh, the idea that you could construct, even if, if you say you can do a purely neural approach to some kind of problem, if the questions aren't quite rich enough, then you come back to these chatbot issues where you ask silly questions and get silly answers. Uh, so what you really need, uh, I mean, I think to have a Turing test in the sense that Turing intended uh, is to have these kinds of tasks or challenges or questions that are deep enough, and in some sense, it this then comes back to the interpretability question, because if the if the system responds in one way or another, you need to be able to probe it to identify what are the steps it took to get there, right? Just saying that this is what you know, this is what my distribution looks like, and this is where it landed with the highest probability doesn't quite cut it, and this means that we are not asking the right questions. We can ask it things like, you know, as has happened with chatbots, very silly questions, and you don't quite get to the heart of the matter. So we do believe these neural systems aren't quite capturing all the semantic relationships we think they should be capturing, but we don't really have benchmarks to probe that, to see why we think it's, you know, it's getting it wrong, even though they might be doing 99.9% .9 or whatever um, are on these benchmarks. Thank you very much, Isaac. So uh, the main takeaways are uncertainty, scalability, benchmarks, which is what I understood from our panel discussion. Uh, we have four minutes to close the panel discussion. I don't want to pick more. Please, from the audience, ask questions or make your comments. So I, I have a question. Uh, too. So what can we do to come up with benchmarks? Are there ideas or you know, workshops? How, how should we start rethinking uh, the aspect of benchmarks where reasoning and neural systems have to come together to solve it, right? I, I, I know AI2 
have been trying to come up with them, but uh, but still a unified QA model comes and cracks it up, right? Uh, there are there are issues even in rethinking benchmarks. While all of us complain about no benchmarks, it's there have I don't know a systematic thinking on how these gen benchmarks can be generated or what's the right way to do it i mean Squale. you you, you... One, one other thing i'll piggyback on that question is um should they be should they be driven mostly by data from industry for instance all the, the work on vision and image recognition and all that are driven largely by data sets which are you know abundantly available in you know in, in the practical industry application so how do we yeah which where should we look at for these sorts of data well my view is data. Uh, i think you know we're a little bit stuck in is my just personal view we're when we think about benchmarks we're so conditioned by the machine learning paradigm you know, you know, I'm mainly a machine learning guy, but in, historically, but um, you know, where which are relatively simple, actually to to make. So I think to to get to the next level, you know, there's some difficulty. You have to get humans to sit down and label things, but I think the next level of to make things hard enough to push to the next level, you actually need to make go all the way to making things that are more like environments and you know in our in current environments in things where you have to take actions the current environments are relatively simple also there are games and stuff that already exist but you know i i think it, we need to put more problem is we actually need to put more effort human effort into making them hard enough so you know Something like even the interactive fiction games, which are pretty hard for all AI methods, but they're still relatively simple. There's a constraint set of actions and so on. So it's, we need to make something more like really operating in the real world. I mean, which kind of maybe leads to full on robotics, um, arguably, but it's something like that. We need to, um, because Benchmarks, we automatically are thinking of data sets, but that kind of maps us back to you know, pattern recognition, which is you know, sort of not hard enough. I want to comment something on the each of benchmarks. First, um, Pasquale pointed to many interesting uh, benchmarks, many interesting pointers. Uh, also, Vice made a nice comment. However, from the industry perspective, I think it would be certainly possible to have some benchmarks from there, especially if they relate to customer data. No company would share so easily there the customer data for the purpose, for any possible purpose, because there are several privacy restrictions that no one is willing to play with them and then be dragged to courts for leaking sensitive information. So if something happens, it should I, as I said, it should originate from the academic community and it should not relate to critical applications uh, that relate to locations, that relate to people, that relate to activities. This is my view on the topic. Any other comment potentially, Bechon, do you want to, to add on? But maybe if, if, if I may just add to that, uh, I think this is exactly where academia and industry can work together very well. All right. So I think uh, I, there, there are many ways for collaboration between industry and academia and the confidentiality or maybe the industry can generate, a, you know, anonymized version of the data or the, but with the data that have the complexity of the features that they have in the real world practice. So uh, assuming that the academic world with particular look at the generation of data, 
it's a very hard task too because uh, there is always uh, limited resources and uh, often these papers, I want to say, papers are easily publishable in top conferences. So there is a lot of other reasons why academia uh, is not really necessarily investing into that research, which is really, really essential. So I think actually we should exploit the, the collaborative uh, um, sort of a trend that in particular UK is witnessing, which is between industry and, and, and university. I think that is where really uh, this collaboration could be very valuable. Comment, Alessandra. Um, Pasquale, you have posted, you are continuously posting networks. Do you mind posting them on Slack? I feel yeah, that 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 now. This. <laughs> do this, please, because we will uh, lose this, uh, the, the, the chat after we log out. In QA, there's a lot of data sets that came up that were basically where you need to kind of do, uh, let's say, compositional reasoning to, to answer the more complex questions. And like, and they started appearing like uh, more and more over the last few months, basically. And that, yeah, shut some pointers. Uh, and of course, yeah, an attack from Tim, uh, with, which probably is the most challenge, one of the most challenging environments for reinforcement learning right now, because there you need to do planning, you need to do, for example, you need to, I don't know, understand that a wolf is this, almost the same as a gray wolf. Uh, like you need to have also do like some common sense, like you need to do some common sense reasoning and understand that your armor will get rusty if you get in the water. Like probably, yeah, that's one, one potentially nice benchmark for testing uh, uh, new symbolic reinforcement learning agents. Thank you very much, Pasquale. Thank you, Pasquale. And please don't forget to post the Fed Marks. And that's right now, otherwise, I'm um, I think, Obi, the stage is yours to do the wrap up.